I'm Shahar Azani and welcome to this JBS special coming to you all the way from Jerusalem, Israel. I have the pleasure of being here at the Jerusalem Press Club and speaking with Talia Dekel Fleissig. Talia is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Press Club. She is in charge of the club's strategy as a service provider for all foreign journalists covering Israel, whether they're covering it from Israel or from around the world. Talia has an illustrious career working with Israel and the media, has a history of working with the Jerusalem Post and beyond, and I'll tell you, she made Talia on her own, coming all the way to Israel from New Zealand. Talia, thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you so much for being here, Shachal. It's such a pleasure to host you uh, today at the Jerusalem Press Club in our Tura restaurant. As you can see, we're right in front of the old city walls of our beautiful city. Um, believe it or not, we're actually in the first neighborhood built beyond the old city walls uh, in 1860. You preceded me and I was about to ask you about this incredible background. How is it working here, coming here to work every day? I'm sure so many of our viewers are so jealous of you. Well, to be honest with you, before I made Aliyah, I couldn't have imagined being here every day in Jerusalem. It really is a dream come true for anyone you know, any Jew living outside of the country. You know, you're touching upon that issue of making Aliyah on your own from New Zealand. What prompted that? How did that work? Uh, so my parents were actually very Zionist. They grew up in Israel. Uh, they left for economic reasons and I always dreamed of coming home. I think what really set it off was actually the second intifada. I was in high school, you know, I was trying to figure out what it is I wanted to do with my life. Most of my friends were uh, planning on going to university uh, to, to, you know, to see what they were going to be when they grow up. And for me, I was looking towards Israel. Um, and it just, it just made sense for me. It was really difficult for me to continue to watch on the news what was being reported uh, during, if you remember at the time, uh, Israel's operation in Jenin. Uh, Operation Defensive Shield and you know constant reports about how Israel was using uh, excessive force allegedly and for me it was you know I felt like there was something more I wanted to explore for myself and that's really what got the ball rolling. You know it's fascinating to listen to you um, and to you what seems to be taken for granted for so many more it's not. You are in New Zealand where sheep outnumber human beings. You have the ability to sink yourself into the beauty of nature and explore so many paths of life. And yet, you had that fire in your heart for Israel and for what's happening here. What's your secret? How did that happen? Was it because of the way you grew up? Was it because of your parents? Was it your innate interest? It's fascinating to hear such an experience. So first of all, I will say that I do go back on occasion to visit. I still have a lot of friends there. Um, it is something that still has a place in my heart, uh, but I have been here now for most of my adult life and this really is home. In terms of what's, what's keeping me here, I guess, is... Or, or what brought you here? Like, what, what was the key for your interest? You're all the way in New Zealand and you're talking to me about the Second Intifada, which was a horrible time here in Israel. It was a horrible time, um, but first remember that I did have, I did have family in Israel. Right. Um, I had uncles, aunts, grandparents, cousins, and I would you know, hear their accounts of what was going on as well. Um, You'd keep in touch regularly. Definitely, you know, we didn't have WhatsApp, and we didn't have Facebook, and right. we didn't have oh, the old even, age. even emails at the time. Right. Like it was what you know, long distance calling once a week, <laughs> yeah. maybe if it was a birthday, twice a week. Right. Uh, we're not where we were then. Um, but you asked about what, 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 what brought me here. Um, my family was a very Zionist family. My parents were always talking about Israel. We had a very Israeli household, uh, even in New Zealand, and also I went to several youth youth movements what was funny is that with such few jews in a country you kind of you grasp at whatever you can so i found myself going to two completely conflicting youth movements uh habonim Dror and uh and Bnei akiva which are very 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 different right. aimed at very different populations and i found myself uh just wanting more wanting more of it and i couldn't get more of it where i was living and I knew that the only place that I would be able to find that missing missing piece of the puzzle was in Israel. And Israel is so lucky to have you with uh, your media background and what you do now for Israel. And the media has always been an issue in the public opinion discourse, especially within the pro-Israel and the Jewish community. And you've been involved in this all your life almost. And I want to ask you, for the sake of our viewers, we are here at this beautiful venue, the Jerusalem Press Club. What is it? What do you do here? So first of all, I just I want to take you back for a second to what you were saying about 
about um, you know um, experience in working with the press. Right. Um, as an 18 year old, it is, it's, it's easy to say, oh, the press should be reporting about this, and you know, it sounds different to what my, my, my own views are. But until you work with the foreign press on a day-to-day -day basis, it's kind of hard to understand both sides. So I think that's something that's important to, to, to point out. Maybe we'll get back to it in a little bit. Uh, but the Jerusalem Press Club itself uh, has been around for almost a decade. It was founded by our director general, Uri Dromi, who was the spokesperson for the Rabin and Paris governments in the 90s, so he's, he's seen a lot. Um, he came to the conclusion that what was really missing uh, from, from the scene was a kind of home away from home for the foreign correspondents covering, covering Israel, uh, a place that would allow them to discover the country in the eyes of the individuals uh, who represent all of Israel's communities. And not limiting them to maybe politically tainted views or otherwise. Uh, and that's what we do here at the club every day. We conduct briefings, uh, tours, interviews, and even social activities for the foreign press covering Israel in the hope that we could actually bridge a kind of gap that has been created between existing assumptions about Israel and the experiences of those who actually live in it day to day or even those who choose to live in it. Uh, so that's what we do here at the club and I think we're doing a pretty good job. I have to ask you, um just, just to make one point clear for our viewers, you are not an Israeli governmental no, agency. No, 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 absolutely not. Yes, I, I mean, we, we, were, we were established by somebody with experience in government, but I think it's that experience that helped him realize that there was, that there was really a vacuum for, uh, for you know, messages of Israel from the bottom up. Uh, we don't have any backing from the government. On occasion, we, you know, we can do some some joint programming, but um, all of our all of our donations come from, you know, uh, from Zionists abroad. Uh, and it's really important to make that clarification. We're entirely independent, and we like to keep it that way. I think that's what makes us credible in the eyes of the journalists. And for us as a team, you know, we have. We have varying views of, uh, between us. Uh, if, if an election were held today, I can tell you that uh, people probably would vote differently. We each come with our own views, and, um, and I think that's what gives us a lot of strength. And what's your relationship with similar organizations abroad? Similar organizations abroad. Who provide service for journalists. Mm. So first of all, I want to say that it's really important that this community is made up of a number of different organizations. God forbid there was a single organization working with the press, because that would just, you know, I don't think that would show uh, what the tr what true Israel really is. Um, in terms of our direct relationships with them, we have a number of joint programming. Um, a lot of times we'll we'll host delegations from. Uh, from different countries that are brought by different different NGOs, which I think is just is just really amazing because it allows us to really echo the message uh, rather than only being you know the sole the sole actor on the scene, uh, and really you know just just capitalize on the on the goodwill of all of the the really amazing work being done out there. You know there are various agencies working with international media. You have you can think off the top of my head about Israel's foreign ministry, about the government press office and others. What makes you stand out in the services you provide? What's the the gap that you're filling through the work that you do? Well look, I think first of all obviously every every government needs its spokesperson. Okay. Every every office needs its official official um, official mechanisms. Uh, we're not a replacement of that. Um, you know, the GPO makes sure that journalists get what they need to get on the ground. All the all the uh, all the bureaucracy Bureaucy. documentation, right. things like that. Right. Um, and I know that they're very helpful with other things on occasion. They were very helpful during during COVID. I can I can say that uh, from from close up. Um, but I think we give them something a little bit different that that a government office can't offer them. Uh, again, what society brings towards uh, towards uh, towards the uh, story. And the, um, the, the kind of services that you provide, what do they need? When you're talking about these services that you provide international media, and I want to emphasize, it's not just media that's here in Israel, right? It's right. anybody in the foreign core who is interested in covering what's happening in Israel, even if they're not physically here. Right, so uh, I'll get to the audience in just a second, but first I'll address your first question on, on the, the services themselves. Um, it ranges from content uh, that is in English that we, we provide to them we, that we provide for them that they might not be able to access on their own. It uh, it comes services also come in the form of, of facilitating uh, facilitating interviews or facilitating um, 
uh, relationships, connections between Israelis and themselves. It's getting, it's helping them get to know stories or other kinds of uh, activities um, that they wouldn't have heard of. I would say that a lot of it comes with, from a language gap because, you know, as, as good as the English level is of this country, and a lot of people don't necessarily have that confidence to go on camera or, or to go on the radio or whatnot. And uh, we, you know, we kind of give them the nudge we give the nudge to the Israelis to to be in front of the in front of the news, and then we are also because of our credibility are able to uh, to give uh, give the reporters that connection, and you know we we've become a trusted source because of that, and the um, and and then these then we have relationships that build build on on top of the the other. If a journalist is you know, has been in, the, in touch with the Jerusalem Press Club, has been a member of the Jerusalem Press Club for a couple of years, and knows that we're a credible source that can be helpful on the ground, then that journalist usually tells their replacement, hey, look, there's this institution that's been really helpful for me. Um, why don't you continue that relationship? And that's something that we enjoy uh, over the years. Um, I want to ask you about something that you mentioned before in our conversation. There is a lot of frustration with many of our viewers, and, and many more who view the international media coverage of Israel as biased, as problematic on so many levels, and there is a lot of complaining being done. But we have an opportunity, sitting with a real professional in the field, to ask you, how do you see this? Like, what is the, the source of this frustration? And what is your advice you may want to give people who are listening to you now from your vast media experience? What don't they get about international media in Israel? Well, look, at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, what is the role of the media? Is the role of the media to provide this perfect picture of, uh, of the country that they're covering? Or is the role of the media to, to really investigate and bring out the truth and show it to the public? I think that the, the purpose is the latter, uh, whether they're doing that or not. I think ultimately, at, at least in 2022, I think we've come a long way, especially since the Second Intifada. I think, I think we've learned a lot, Israelis have learned a lot, the different institutions have learned a lot, the NGOs have learned, and, and, um, and I think the media has learned a lot too. The media knows about the importance of showing both sides of the story, and I think that's what we're here to do. We're here to help them see all the sides of the story. And look, to, to, to answer those who are complaining at the end of the day, um, be the story. If you don't like the story that's being shown, make sure that your messages are the ones that are being presented. If you have an amazing initiative, if you know about a certain project that's happening, you know, there's so many beautiful things going on in Israeli society, whether it's about um, coexistence, whether it's about diversity, whether it's just getting whatever message it is that you want to get out, then get out there. Be the story. What a wonderful ending note for our conversation. If you don't like the story, be the story, Talia tells us, which I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your wise words and for hosting us in this auspicious and beautiful place. Thank you so much, Shachal. It's been a pleasure. And to you, I say this is all for this JBS special coming to you from Jerusalem. And we'll see you with much more content relevant for everything that we need to know about Israel and what's happening today. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Shalom and Leitraot.